For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. Hello and welcome to another edition of Capital Calculus on Strat News Global. This is the show that examines policies and developments through the intersection of politics and economics to share a fresh perspective with you every week, especially to unpack the underlying strategic implications. I am your host Anil Padmanabhan. Last month, Foreign Minister S. Jay Shankar addressed a book launch. It turned out to be a master class on India's emerging soft power capabilities. He began by defining soft power. Let's listen in. So, at the end of the day, soft power is about creating narratives. Uh, it is about uh, making uh, images. Uh, it is about setting standards so that the rest of the world is conditioned to actually deal with those standards uh, as a reference point and uh, it allows actually the standard setter uh, to evaluate the rest of the world uh, within a framework which they have created. Now, today, India is actually in the softer part of the soft soul. Uh, that uh, when we talk about soft power, uh, it is, as I said, largely this exercise of creating comfort. Uh, I think uh, there is both a power explanation for it, but I think there is also a cultural, historical explanation. In a way, you can say this is the Indian way of creating uh, or advancing uh, soft power. The minister didn't stop there. He went on to explain the present context where soft power is more than just a foreign policy tool especially for India. So how do I see it uh, as a foreign minister, as someone who has looked at the world and diplomacy? Where does soft power fit uh, in the larger scheme of things? I regard it today, in fact, as absolutely central to the rebalancing which is going on in the world, uh, a rebalancing which will create, which is already creating multipolarity. Typically, when we think of rebalancing, you know, we look at the economic facet. You know, we say, okay, these are the 20 countries with the largest GDP. Or we look uh, at the military facet. You know, we say, okay, these countries have nuclear weapons or they have power projection or they have a veto in the UN Security Council. But rebalancing is something much more because uh, beyond economics, beyond politics, beyond orthodox conventional parameters of strength and influence, that is really where soft power comes into play. And we have seen in history that there can be very powerful countries, but who have actually failed in the soft power front and therefore uh, met uh, political reverses. It is not something which is that far back in history. So I see today uh, culture, that connecting through culture, the, the comfort uh, that is uh, growing about India, I see that actually as very, very central to the rebalancing and something which works uh, very much to India's advantage. And it is necessary today because uh, after uh, two centuries of uh, Western uh, imperialism, uh, we actually have, have been, you know, uh, the legacy of the world in a way is that globalization is westernization. And this rebalancing today is a, is a huge historical corrective process uh, which is in the making. It is uh, enabling us to revisit many of the compromises and the balances that societies struck among themselves in the last uh, 200 years. And it is both a reflection of new power distribution, it is also in a way a driver of uh, new power equations. So I see uh, for me today soft power connecting through cultures as having a very vital place uh, in the implementation of diplomacy. The foreign minister has laid it out very nicely for us. Traditionally, 
India's soft power has been defined around yoga, art, music and of course Bollywood. More recently, it has acquired a new calling card, homegrown software applications to do public good. Whether it is Aadhaar, UPI, Covin or Jandhan, they all have one thing in common, a public digital architecture. In other words, anyone, it can be government or private sector, can build innovations on top of this. This alternative to a closed loop, which comes with an entry tax, is naturally attractive. To help us understand this aspect of India's soft power, I spoke to Sanjay Anandaram. Sanjay is a veteran entrepreneur, venture capitalist, corporate executive, board member, guide, mentor, name it. He is also the co-founder of NICE, which is a network of Indian cultural enterprises. I began by asking Sanjay to take us to the beginning of this phenomenon. Uh, it all started in uh, 2009 when the Aadhaar project got initiated. And at that point in time, the objective was to ensure that every resident of India uh, received a unique identity such that targeted benefits and subsidies and other government uh, services could be provided to individuals directly to ensure that you know the estimated 70 to 80 percent leakage that occurred in the transmission of uh, cash and other benefits to residents uh, was not uh, continuing. So that was the higher order objective at that point in time. And then the Aadhaar project itself, as you now know, it is 13 years old and it a bunch of things have been built on top of it. As Aadhaar itself evolved, then came the other issue of, okay, now that we've been able to give people uh, identities, the question is how do we ensure that the people who have those identities indeed are able to get the benefit of that identity. Therefore, you needed to have bank accounts into which this would flow. And hence, there was this massive effort to open up bank accounts. And a lot of those were zero balance accounts just to enable people to have the experience of having a bank account for the first time in their lives. So about 400 million plus bank accounts have been opened. As you know, more than a billion Aadhaars, or about 1.3 billion Aadhaar ID cards um, have been issued. So the second step was the bank accounts. Now, when you have the bank accounts, one has to then have the ability to essentially sign in, sign off on transactions. And given the distances, given the infrastructure, given the um, uh, literacy levels and a whole host of other uh, challenges, was it possible to now use the mobile phone to be able to do all of these? And for the bank to indeed do an EKYC, to do an e-signature and so on. Now, at the same time, there was a massive growth in the mobile phone acquisition and usage. So the mobile phone now became the low cost access mechanism that didn't exist earlier. So you had the uh, Aadhaar, now you've got the uh, mobile phone, and then you had the bank accounts. So this, these three things uh, you know, came to be known as the jam trinity. J for Jandhan, A for Aadhaar, M for Mobile. And that's how it all started. Clearly, Aadhaar provided the foundation for the rollout of UPI and Jandhan. But India's public digital architecture did not stop with financial inclusion. On top of all of this, the idea of empowering people got encapsulated in what is called the consent layer or the DEPA architecture, which is the data empowerment and protection architecture, which essentially allows every uh, person to give their consent to how their information, their transaction information, their identity information and other information, how it is used, how long it will be used for, by whom will it be used, under what conditions, etc., etc. All of that is governed by the, the, the DEPA. And then recently the RBI announced the account aggregator framework, which essentially 
uses the DEPA model uh, to be able to ensure that credit flows to the uh, deserving and those who need it is able to be done very, very smoothly in a friction-free manner. Over 1 billion bank accounts are now part of the account aggregator. Uh, and a host of other initiatives, be it in drones, be it in agriculture, be it in logistics, uh, be it in um, healthcare. We are seeing the uh, Ayushman Bharat program. We saw it in the case of COVID, uh, you know, and any number of examples today, all across India, across sectors, digital means of societal transformation via public goods become pretty much an accepted norm. And that's been the uh, accelerated journey from 2009 till now. And each of the new initiatives is taking lesser and lesser time than the initiative that preceded it. Interestingly, India's success with public digital goods is beginning to get global eyeballs. Its phenomenal success with COVID to roll out 2 billion jabs has evinced the interest of 50 countries who want to sign up the COVID platform to roll out their own vaccination programs. Clearly, this is not a one-off. Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, there's no question about that, Anil. And uh, the reason for that, the reason for that uh, is, as always, a combination of several uh, mega slash meta trends. One is, of course, the changing geopolitics around the globe. Uh, you know, so there is the EU... Uh, there is the US, there is the China angle, and then, of course, there's this new emerging uh, angle of India, right? Um, so there, they all follow different approaches. Uh, the US is largely private sector led with the uh, government operating uh, kind of uh, uh, from behind. Uh, you have China, which is a walled garden approach that everything happens within China, by China, for China. And then you've got the EU approach, which is a standards and uh, legal framework oriented approach. Um, the Indian approach, which is uh, suitable for most of the world, because most of the world is like India, you know, it's helping. And that offers what is called the digital public goods or digital public infrastructure. What that means is that most countries do not have the capacity to be able to create this infrastructure to enable better governance and better delivery of services to their people. At the same time, they do not want to be beholden to any other country. They don't want to be tied into a specific technology or a specific vendor. And hence the idea of having this open digital public goods slash public uh, infrastructure. And that thinking has been entirely led by India because it is the only country that has been able to deploy these offerings at, al at almost continent scale. All of a sudden, India's soft power has acquired new wings. Yes. The, the, you know, uh, one way to think of this is software as soft power. Um, and uh, what that means is for China, if you look at the China model uh, with regard to, let's say, offering their software, which largely, quote unquote, hard in that there is cash, there is the building of infrastructure, um, you know, those kinds of things, whether it's the Belt and Road Initiative or the creation of ports, uh, you know, and of obviously providing financial assistance and all that right but what i would broadly classify as hard infrastructure as foreign policy for india it's clearly software led and so one way to think about it is software as soft power obvious question then is the balance between hard power and soft power shifting in favor of the latter does this hand india an advantage over other countries let's say economic might, uh, trade power, military power, right? These are necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, the branding power of a country, the positive image that a country has uh, in another country, etc., are all what determine the soft power, quote unquote, index, right? 
from india's perspective the only industry that india is globally recognized for regarded for and respected for is technology and it right over 200 billion dollars worth and it is evident to the world at large that indian software talent is extraordinarily deep and is capable of extremely complex execution and conceptualization and the fact that india has been able to deploy this at continent scale is actually proof of the pudding for in the case of digital public infrastructure and therefore from india's standpoint the ability to leverage this as a geopolitical vehicle to be able to enable other countries around the world address their concerns with regard to dealing with a potentially hegemonic power or being locked into a particular technology or being locked into a particular vendor uh, all of those get let's say um, significantly mitigated by working with a country like india or rather working with india primarily because india is not seen as a hegemonic power india is offering a lot of these as uh, in an open manner the and these are all being offered as digital public infrastructures the control remains with the uh, other country they are free to have their own uh, private sector participants if they so choose to be able to build final solutions for their people as per their use cases and their requirements but on digital public rails that india can offer traditionally india's soft power has been built around cultural motifs like yoga cuisine and bollywood how does the new digital economy stack up in this lexicon of soft power uh, the way i would characterize it anil is that um the digital economy is a significant addition to india's arsenal uh, because you can't let's say recreate the magic of a uh, of the indian uh, entertainment industry in very many countries right uh, with the soft power angle so i think they have to go together this can become a brahmastra if i can use that uh, word uh, in the arsenal um, and clearly as india itself uh, grows its economy and uh, builds let's say economic muscle as well a lot of the indian traditional elements of soft power you talked about uh, cuisine you talked about uh, arts and films and things of the kind all of those two will start traveling under a branded uh, pr- set of products services and experiences just by way of a, a quick example uh, you know yoga is a 80 billion dollar global industry um, you know and uh, we don't have an have a, a global indian yoga brand right because most of the economic value out of that in uh, brands uh, outside of india so how does one create this economic uh, value from our traditional cultural assets alongside the new economy digital economy led soft power i think that is going to be the way the future will unfold what then will it take to monetize india's growing comfort with the digital economy no no question about it no question about it anil uh, clearly india needs to uh, step on the accelerator and kind of lead the brigade uh, with regard to uh, not just spreading awareness but in actively engaging with countries outside of india number 2 participating in standards committees to be able to create standards that india has designed for the world and make sure that a lot of these standards uh, become well standards by that other uh, uh, countries use third is to create a thriving ecosystem of private companies that are able to take advantage of these digital public infrastructures and build solutions and services and experiences for people in their own countries right so clearly there is a very very good um, open 
mechanism available by people in other countries uh, and india should be able to facilitate that by like you said by becoming more aggressive and assertive about what we have achieved because traditionally anil we've been recipients of technology transfers uh, we have not had the experience of providing energy to other countries particularly in uh, the new uh, economy areas uh, like software and digital and this is a new experience so a lot of us have to become more aware of it have become have to become more confident about what india has achieved because it is truly uh, uh, revolutionary and pioneering and that is the confidence that we need to be able to have when we speak to other countries you heard sanjay he has made an elaborate and convincing case about india's new found soft power capabilities this is of particular advantage in a rapidly fragmenting global polity where hard power is recognizing its limits the question is whether india can move fast and well enough to exploit this advantage thank you for watching do subscribe to strat news global on youtube hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates and please do share your feedback and insights with us i am available on twitter at capital calculus and i'll be back next week with another episode of capital calculus till then stay safe Thank you.